Theda Perdue is the Atlanta Distinguished Professor of Southern Culture at the University of North Carolina. She has written extensively on Native Americans in the South and published seven books, including The Cherokee Nation and the Trail of Tears and Mixed Blood Indians. Please welcome Theda Perdue. Thank you very much. I appreciate this invitation, and I am delighted to be here. Uh, I know a number of people in the audience, but I would particularly like to recognize the person in the audience who has known me longest, and that is Professor Doc Graham from Kennesaw State University. I went to kindergarten with her. <laughs> and you would think by now she had heard all she wanted to hear from me, but she's here tonight, and I am very, very grateful. I, I treasure our friendship, and I'm pleased that, that she came out along with a number of other old friends, and uh, I hope some new ones. So thanks, Dot, for coming. What I'm going to do tonight is to read a rather formal lecture about the Cotton States Exposition. I've just finished a book on race in the Cotton States Exposition that is um, the written version of three lectures that I did at Georgia Southern University uh, about a year and a half ago. Now, the Cotton States Exposition was a very big deal in Atlanta in the 1890s, and it's been a very big deal in Southern history ever since then. If you know anything about the Cotton States Exposition, it's probably that it was the place where Booker T. Washington delivered the speech that has come to be known as the Atlanta Compromise. It's the speech in which he suggests that segregation is uh, the way that, that the races should interact on a social level while they work together for economic progress. Now, this was, this was an incredible speech, and it had, it had long-term implications for the South, for its history, for race relations. But one of the things that it's done is, is it, it has obscured everything else that happened at the Cotton States Exposition. And I think there's much more that happened there that we need to pay attention to. At the same time, we should never lose sight of Washington's speech. Because Washington, Washington described race relations that not only characterized Southern society, but this, that Southern leaders hoped to use as a template for conducting race relations around the globe. And so tonight what I want to talk about is the global South and the way in which particular perceptions about race shaped America's thinking and in particular the South's thinking uh, about empire, about international trade, about a whole host of issues in, involving the globe. So that's where this fits. It's actually the third chapter in the book. This is a condensed version of it complete with pictures. And uh, so I will talk tonight about specifically the Global South. In the spring of 1895, publicity about the Cotton States and International Exposition, a World's Fair scheduled for the fall in Atlanta, piqued the interest of Samuel P. Hall from Petersburg, Virginia. Times were tough. The depression that had begun in earnest in 1893 seemed reluctant to loosen its hold on the nation, and the prospects for economic success were bleak. Hall was an enterprising young man, so he wrote to Isaac Avery, the exposition's commissioner to Latin America, to inquire about potential opportunities for him in southern latitudes. Hall realized that he needed more than employment advice. So he inquired about the United States' hemispheric neighbor. What is the general accepted language of said country, he wrote. The depth of Hall's ignorance is astounding to those of us who live in the 21st century global south. He did not know that the dominant language south of the border, and he was unaware that South America was, in fact, a continent composed of many nations instead of a single country. Hall's lack of information, however, was not unusual. 
Like other world's fairs, the Cotton States and International Exposition sought to educate its visitors about the broader world. But organizers intended for that education to produce tangible results, specifically an increase in foreign trade. Therefore, the exposition invested considerable resources in attracting foreign ex exhibitors and visitors to Atlanta. Businessmen from the United States presumably would learn what raw materials and products were available elsewhere, and foreigners who attended the exposition would find out what the South, in particular, produced. The Global South seemed a real possibility in 1895. From the very beginning, organizers envisioned the Cotton States Exposition as a trade fair. As early as December 1893, the Atlanta Constitution published a map that, uh, with straight lines drawn between Nassau and Des Moines, Havana and Chicago, Mexico City and New York, all of them intersected in Atlanta. With rail lines radiating out and linking the interior city to several southern ports, Atlanta seemed to be a natural entrepot for the shipment of goods. The late 19th and early 20th centuries were awash with expositions and invitations to send exhibits to foreign climes poured into the world's capitals. By, 1890, by the 1890s, governments were carefully weighing which expositions to support with appropriations of public funds and which to pass up. As a result, expositions needed far more than a mere letter of invitation to attract foreign participation. The Cotton States Exposition became a serious competitor on the world stage when the United States endorsed the exposition and provided funding. Letters of invitation went out from the State Department to countries in Europe, Latin America, and Asia. Leaving nothing to chance, the organizers of the Cotton States Exposition appointed commissioners to Mexico, South America, and Europe, whose job it was to secure support of foreign governments and solicit private exhibits. The most successful of these commissioners was Isaac Avery, former editor of the Atlanta Constitution and the person to whom Samuel Hall addressed his inquiry. Enthusiasm for the exposition abounded in many quarters and optimism in Atlanta soared as letters expressing interest poured into exposition offices. Exposition president Charles Collier acknowledged the centrality of these exhibits to the success of the exposition. We are, of course, using the fact of foreign participation for all it's worth, he wrote, and it is a proving, it's proving to be a very attractive card. Alas, reality eventually set in. Despite encouraging messages, relatively little materialized. Transportation costs, competing expositions, and domestic problems limited foreign involvement. But some of the obstacles to participation originated with the exposition itself. The whole idea of an exposition held in Atlanta to stimulate international trade struck some as a problematic enterprise whose objectives could best be met by exhibiting North American products at expositions in Latin American cities. Furthermore, Atlanta was a city not well known to most people outside the United States. When the commissioner sent to Europe introduced himself, the first response of prospective exhibitors was, Atlanta? Where is that? One British newspaper even reported that the exposition was in Atlantic City instead of Atlanta. What the world knew about the South was often unflattering or downright scary. In the year before the Cotton States Exposition, a representative of the British Anti-Lynching Committee investigated racial violence in the South and pointed to, and I quote, the disgrace that attaches to a section in which lynch law prevails. The Mexican Herald used the term racial war to describe race relations in the South. Such descriptions were not conducive to attracting foreign exhibits. If many foreigners had a narrow conception of the region and the exposition, 
most Southerners were fairly clueless about the rest of the world. Indeed, Samuel Hall's ignorance about South America was not exceptional, suggesting a provincialism that produced unfounded expectations of the international appeal of the exposition. Avery, the most adept of the foreign commissioners, described his knowledge of the Spanish language as a smattering and explained his deficiency in terms that no doubt would resonate with modern North Americanos. I am afraid foreign languages are too hard for me to tackle. Organizers wanted to open Atlanta to the world, but it was a world they knew very little about. One of the reasons Southerners knew so little about the rest of the world was the difficulty of direct interaction. It took three months, for example, for mail to reach Argentina. Even Mexico City had been inaccessible before the completion of the rail line to the Gulf port of Veracruz in, eight, in the 1870s, and direct access to the southern United States did not come until the 1880s when the Na Mexican National Railway completed the line to Laredo. Until then, the highest-ranking Mexican official to visit the exposition remarked, it would have seemed like going to Africa to come to this country. Norte Americanos no doubt felt the same about going to Mexico. Suspicion of foreigners also put a damper on the exposition. Nativism, the intense opposition to immigration, is a hallmark of, the late, of late 19th century America. In the 1890s, four million people immigrated to the United States. Many of them were from Eastern or Southern Europe, and native-born Americans perceived them as poor, unskilled peasants who clustered in urban slums and resisted assimilation. They often were Catholic or dark-skinned or political radicals. Native-born Americans increasingly linked them to immorality, crime, political corruption, labor unrest, and terrorism and politicians moved to stem the tide of immigration. Relatively few immigrants had moved south, but those who did often encountered resentment and hostility. Such attitudes boded ill for foreign exhibitors at the Cotton Stakes Exposition, who needed to bring laborers, vendors, and performers. To ensure that foreign workers returned home after the exposition, Immigrations and customs officials issued each person entering the country a certificate granting admission that had to be surrendered when he or she left the country. The Cotton States Exposition wanted foreign exhibits, visitors, and trade, but Southerners did not want foreigners. The majority of foreign employees at the Cotton States Exposition worked for concessionaires who operated attractions along Midway Heights. Alongside animal shows, the Ferris wheel, and the first commercial moving picture show were ethnographic villages. Introduced at the Paris Exposition of 1889, ethnographic villages depicted exotic ways of life through displays, performances, and the people themselves. One of the most populous vi villages in Atlanta was the Chinese village. Securing entry of Chinese people to operate the attraction was no easy matter. In 1882, the United States had passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which prohibited the immigration of Chinese laborers for 10 years. In 1892, Congress renewed the act and required all Chinese residents to register with the government. Despite these restrictions, Qi Ao Yang, a college-educated businessman who managed the Chinese department of a New York bank, obtained a congressional resolution permitting him to bring in Chinese immigrants for the specific purpose of appearing at the Cotton States Exposition. Like other foreigners who came to work at the exposition, the Chinese had to get a certificate when they entered and depart within the year. The arrival of 206 Chinese in Atlanta just before the fair opened in September of 1895 
provoked controversy. The party consisted mostly of men and boys, but there also were 34 women. These women were a rarity. The vast majority of Chinese immigrants to the United States had been men, a circumstance that made these women the subjects of intense curiosity, concern, and perhaps even lust. They ranged in age from 16 to 24, with most of them being under 20. And they listed their occupations as maids, singers, or actresses. The last of these, actress, was patently untrue, since boys played the female roles in Chinese dramas, a fact that brought some embarrassment to naive young men in Atlanta who had been in the habit of sending bonbons and flowers to the Chinese prima donnas. Lum Ling, a local laundry owner who was the leader of Atlanta's small Chinese community, feared a far more sinister deception was underway at the Chinese village. Lum charged that when the exposition ended, the young women would be sold for immoral purposes. In order to evade detection, he claimed, Key would send older, less desirable women back to China in their place. To prevent the switch, Lum hired attorneys who filed a writ of, of habeas corpus on the grounds that the women were being held in violation of the 13th Amendment that outlawed slavery. Nine of the Chinese beauties, as they were always referred to in the paper, uh, appeared in court and testified that they had come to Atlanta of their own free will and intended to return to China. The judge ruled that they were not being held as slaves and ordered them back to the Chinese village. Having failed in court, the local Chinese put the Midway village under surveillance. On November 22nd, the Sentinel saw three hacks drive up to the Chinese village and spirit away 20 of the women. They chased the hacks, but realizing that the pursuit was futile, they informed Long Ling, who notified the police, who ignored him. The women did not return, and by the time the Chinese village closed, only 60 Chinese remained. That's 60 out of the 206. Some had departed for Hong Kong, but most had gone to San Francisco for what remained of the year they had been granted in the United States. How many actually departed at the end of the year is unknown. The saga of the Chinese beauties raises a number of questions. Was Qi as disreputable as he appears? Why did Lum and the other Atlanta Chinese become involved in this? Why did the court and the police not take the matter more seriously? Underlying the answers to these questions is a racism as profound as that against which African Americans struggled. He might well have been a scoundrel, but he also subtly challenged the Chinese Exclusion Act. Most immigrants were men. And they often had left wives and children behind while they sought work in mining camps, on railroads, or as canal builders. The act made it nearly impossible for men to return to China, visit their families, and then re-enter the United States. One solution to the problem was exactly the scheme that critics attributed to Key. A group of immigrants arrived with permission to stay temporarily, and when it came time to leave, immigrants who wanted to return home took their place. Whether he actually engaged in such subterfuge is uncertain, but he did vehemently oppose the Chinese Exclusion Act as a violation of treaty rights and international law. A decade after the Cotton States Exposition, he penned an attack on the United States immigration policies, whose passage he attributed to political demagogues. The act excluding Chinese immigration, he wrote, was not tempered with justice or a square deal. The reason for excluding Chinese people is racial, not economic. The nativist movement of the late 19th century became profoundly racist when immigration involved color. And such attitudes easily took root in the South. One can only imagine the terror of Atlanta's small Chinese community 
uh, the terror they must have felt when they suspected that Key was intentionally subverting immigration legislation. In the dozen years before the Cotton States Exposition, whites in Georgia had beaten, robbed, and threatened to lynch Chinese businessmen. Atlanta's Chinese had little choice but to disassociate themselves from the Midway Village and its concessionaire. The failure of authorities to give credence to the charges Lumling lodged reveals the disdain they felt for local Chinese. Lum was a successful businessman who spoke English and had sufficient means to hire attorneys, but white men preferred to leer at the Chinese beauties rather than take seriously the danger they were in. In the minds of officials, their race make, made them prostitutes who did not deserve equal protection of the law, and Lum's race made him an inconsequential annoyance. The tone that pervades coverage of the incident in the Atlanta Constitution is one of slightly amused condescension. The Chinese might be appropriate denizens of the Midway, but they had little place in Atlanta beyond the exposition gates. Although nativism reached its racist extreme with the Chinese, white Atlantans denigrated other foreigners of color, of color by, by construing them as exotic others whose inferior cultures were subordinate to their own. This attitude was hardly conducive to attracting foreign exhibits to the fair. As it turned out, the Cotton States and International Exposition had relatively few international exhibits. And only Costa Rica provided its own building, which consisted of two adjoining pavilions where a Stara Opticon showed beautiful views of Costa Rica and patrons sipped Costa Rican coffee and hot chocolate. The other official exhibits came from Venezuela, Mexico, Argentina, and Chile. These nations display raw materials, minerals, samples of wood, wool, cotton, and other agricultural products. But they also included a surprising number of finished goods. Wines, books, cigarettes and cigars, liquors, armaments, and equine tack appeared in the exhibits. But the most alarming to southern entrepreneurs were the bolts of wool, silk, and cotton fabric, the very commodity that southerners had hoped to sell abroad. The five Latin American exhibits presented a fairly coherent view of the sponsoring countries, but the same could not be said for the other foreign exhibits at the Cotton States Exposition. No other countries sent national exhibits. Instead, manufacturers or distributors simply presented their specific products. Other exhibits consisted of items such as artwork thought to be of general interest and secured by employees of the exposition. From Belgium came lace, cut glass, and machinery. From Great Britain, pianos, bicycles, electrical appliances, woolens, china, and pottery. From Germany, china and glassware. From Austria, bohemian glass. From Italy, coral, diamonds, jewelry, and marble statues. From Russia, furs. And from France, painting, paintings, bronzes, and tapestries. Other countries were represented by similarly diverse exhibits. Europe, however, was not the part of the world that most interested the organizers of the Cotton States Exposition. United States nationalism and Southern chauvinism drove the international component of the Cotton States Exposition. The United States was on the brink of an overseas empire, and the exposition embodied imperial ambitions. Two situations held potential for the South. The first was the Cuban War for Independence, which erupted in February 1895, and the other was the construction of a canal across Central America. Although Cuba was still a colony of Spain, entrepreneurs in the United States had invested considerable capital in the island. Geography seemed to privilege southern commercial relations with Cuba, whether it remained free, as Cuban revolutionaries hoped, or the United States annexed it, as most people in the country advocated. As for the canal, such a waterway would open the Pacific to southern products and southern ports to ships making the transit. 
The Cotton States Exposition promoted both the Canal and Cuban independence and paved the way for the empire the United States acquired three years later in the Spanish-American War. Race formed an ideological base for imperialism, and expositions became powerful tools for instilling views that justified empire. In the late 19th century, characteristics, characteristics believed to be immutable grouped people together and distinguished them from all other human beings. Individual differences between members of a specific race did not change the fact that they shared essential elements that defined who they were and what they could achieve. Efforts to describe and distinguish between the different races resulted in extraordinarily simplistic depictions. You see an example here. White Americans often froze people in time and measured their own contemporary accomplishments against what were often the outdated practices of others. This calculation contributed to the overall purpose of expositions. The inventions, products, learning, and art on display in the official buildings projected the superiority of the United States. Other cultures served as foils against which to measure the achievements of the host. The foreign exhibits in the main building of the Cotton States Exposition did not entirely succeed at this task. They were too few in number and too idiosyncratic to provide a clear contrast to the displays from the United States. Fairgoers had to learn their global lessons elsewhere. And the most popular schoolrooms were the ethnographic villages. Ethnographic villages lined the midway. Private concessionaires operated these, and their goal was to turn a profit, not to educate or stimulate trade. Generally, the vi villages depicted everyday life, presented displays that included photographs and stage performances. They also sold handicrafts, food, and drink. Organizers located the Japanese and Mexican villages on the main grounds uh, and Buffalo Bill's Wild West show on the periphery. But they considered these three attractions to be part of the Midway because they too were private enterprises designed to entertain. M. Fujisawa, the Japanese concessionaire, request, requested a site away from the Midway because he planned a high-class attraction in contrast to the somewhat tawdry and sensationalist villages on the Midway. Organizers allotted him a place near the center of the grounds on the banks of the Lake Claremere, perhaps because they conceived of Japanese culture as the most advanced of any in Asia, and therefore inappropriate for portrayal on the Midway proper. The Meiji Restoration in 1868, which returned the emperor to the Japanese throne but placed power in the hands of an entrepreneurial elite, resulted in the rapid centralization, industrialization, and militarization of the nation. The dramatic changes led many Westerners to conclude that the Japanese were the aristocrats of the Orient. Just because the Japanese ranked ahead of other Asian people, however, did not mean that they struck Atlantans as familiar. The chief of concessions had to intercede when whites-only Atlanta hotels refused to rent Fujisawa a room. For ordinary Atlantans, the physical appearance of the Japanese was enough to determine their status. The location of the Mexican village reflected the high priority that the directors attached to stimulating trade with Mexico. But other factors contributed to its prime location. The concessionaire promised to erect a three-acre village costing $100,000 that presented a characteristic and picturesque representation of Mexican life, comprising scenes between the Yucatan and the Rio Grande. The attractions within the village were numerous, but the primary reason the concessionaire needed a very large site was to accommodate a bull ring. The publicist for the for the Cotton States Exposition proclaimed that the bullfight would rival the Wild West show as a drawing card. 
What it actually drew was a storm of public criticism. Well aware of the squeamishness of Norte Americanos, the concessionaire promised that the bullfight would be carried out without the slightest cruelty. He planned to pad the horns of the bulls, protect the horses with embossed leather shields, and arm the matadors with a telescoping sword for the death stroke. At the end of this bloodless bullfight, a somewhat irritated but unharmed bull would saunter back to its pen to await its next performance. But then a gadfly named William Hosea Ballou got wind of the bullfight. Claiming to represent the American Humane Society of New York, Ballou headed for Georgia, ready to brave the possibility of lynching to stop the bullfight. When the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, an older rival organization, inquired of the exposition directors as to the truth of rumors about a bullfight, the directors set forth plans for the sham corrida and laid to rest that organization's concerns. Ballou, however, demanded that the directors halt the event. When they refused, he appealed to the Secretary of the Treasury to stop the importation of the bulls. When he failed there, he demanded the impeachment of the Secretary. He accosted the governor of Georgia, who told him that the bullfight would go on. Atlanta wants it, and Atlanta gets what she wants, the governor said. Ballou replied, never, never, never. For their part, the directors of the exposition initially welcomed the publicity, which made Ballou seem even more ridiculous by dubbing him W. Hosiery Ballou and accusing him of tilting at windmills. They even printed doggerel. He would shoot on the shores all the mad matadors that brainlessly bothered a bull. The drumbeat of criticism from Ballou, however, began to take its toll. The ASPCA denounced him, but the organization wanted the controversy ended because it feared Ballou would make the protection of animals the subject of ridicule. The Women's Christian Temperance Union in Atlanta adopted a resolution in opposition to the bullfight, and the national organization lent its support, even to the point of trying to halt display of the Liberty Bell at the exposition unless it banned the bullfight. Exposition directors worried that the bullfight controversy was overshadowing all other features of the exposition. And late in August, as the bullring was going up, they voted to ban it from the grounds. That action did not end the bullfighting saga. The director's decision forced the concessionaire to discharge the 14 bullfighters he had brought from Mexico, a move that prompted them to threaten a suit for wages. This is sounding remarkably modern, don't you think? He reinstated them, but ordered them to a parade around the grounds suited in their colorful regalia. The bullfighters were not happy with the arrangement, and most declined to wear their regular fighting costume to parade. Threatened with dismissal, they eventually complied except for Bayon, who adamantly refused. The concessionaire, the, the concessionaire then fired him, and the other matadors walked out. The concessionaire then had no matadors, but he did have a bull, imported for the fight at a cost of $150. So he ordered the animal turned loose in the bull ring to snort and paw. When the bull was exhausted from tearing up hats and other items that patrons tossed to him, a man tried to ride him around the bull ring. Finally, horsemen lassoed him and returned him to his paddock where he ate prodigious quantities of hay. Compared to a bullfight, this was pretty tame stuff. So the manager of the striking matadors got a better idea. Having secured local financing, he erected a bull ring just outside the exposition grounds. Because the city and state already had taken the position that the sham fight was legal, authorities could do nothing to thwart him. The want of a bull almost derailed the fight, 
but organizers located a sufficiently ferocious specimen in the Florida Everglades and shipped him to Atlanta. Finally, on November 1st, Atlantans got the opportunity to witness the great drama of life and death. Except, of course, there was little danger of the latter since the manager scrupulously adhered to the original rules. The matadors took turn provoking the bull to charge them before the star of the show performed the final act with an imitation sword that simply collapsed. In the 19th century, those who engaged in bullfighting had ancestral ties to Spain, Portugal, or southern France. Why they fought bulls and other people of European ancestry did not provided an opportunity for much speculation about racial difference that centered on stereotypes of hot-blooded Latins and the more refined sensibilities of Anglo-Saxons. An Atlanta delegation that had visited Mexico to promote the Cotton States Exposition attended a bullfight, but spectacle supposedly repulsed them. The response is a bit surprising since the delegation represented a society in which hunting wild animals was a highly regarded male pastime and the slaughter of domestic animals was a scene to which virtually everyone was exposed. Perhaps it was not the blood but the bloodlust that troubled members of the delegation. The passion of the spectators and the seeming foolhardiness of the matador combined with the slaughter of the animals to unnerve the Atlanta visitors. They represented the industrial order of the modern world, whose progress the exposition celebrated. The bullfight hearkened to an ancient world that challenged modernity. The devotion of Mexicans to their national sport suggested that they were irredeemably caught in that world and incapable of progress. The persistence of the bullfight in Mexico, according to the ASPCA, was an outrage upon American civilization. Many Norte Americanos regarded the sport as a metaphor for Mexico itself. Wild, crude, primitive, backward. Bullfighting also was overtly sexual. The tight-fitting torridor pants, the bright colors, the strutting, the teasing of the bull, the pelvic thrusts, the welling excitement, the thrilling climax. Still firmly in the grip of 19th century Victorianism with its public emphasis on sexual restraint and its private fascination with pornography, Atlantans both recoiled from and sought the spectacle. Excitement and danger characterized the sham bullfight that actually took place in Atlanta. But voiding the climax demonstrated restraint and made the sham more culturally acceptable. Self-control separated the event as acted out in Atlanta from the more authentic spectacle just as strength of will enabled so-called civilized men to control their baser instincts and distinguished them from savages. Raw sexuality was a dangerous thing, especially in men of color. And if patting the bull's horns dampened the ardor of the crowd, white Atlantans could breathe a sigh of relief. Unrepressed female sexuality was also a marker of savagery, and Atlantans had to look no further than the midway to find that as well. The Chinese beauties titillated, as did an international beauty show, but not as aggressively as the dancers from the streets of Cairo. The streets of Cairo involved far more than dancing. Sword fights, acrobats, donkey and camel rides, Turkish candy, tobacco, and coffee. But the real attraction, the one that drew in record crowds, was the women with their dark eyes and olive skin, who were reputed to be the most graceful women on earth in the dance. The dance performed at the streets of Cairo was not what we commonly think of today as a belly dance or exotic dance. The women were fully covered, 
but they were not corseted. And in, late in the late 19th century, observers found the life and fluid movements of their unrestricted bodies exceedingly sensual. The Midway Barker described it as the most unique dance ever seen in any country. Then he addressed the most germane issue for many Atlantans. Is it a moral dance? The answer was, no, no, my friends, a moral dance is not what you come here to see. It is a wicked, a lawless dance, but beautiful, wonderful. The theater was crowded at every performance, and women as well as men went to see it. The newspaper acknowledged that it is one of the fads of the present day, which must and will have its run and which everybody will see. The dance made the streets of Cairo by far the most profitable attraction on the Midway. It commanded so much attention that the National Association of Manufacturers went on record in opposition to it at fairs because it diverted visitors away from other exhibits. By late October, a month or so after the fair began, the dance came to the attention of the state legislature, which, finding no law on the book that forbade such a thing, promptly attempted to pass one. Opposition to the bill was slight, but one brave representative responded that he knew of no law that compelled people to attend the performances. He reminded his colleagues that they could not purify the moral atmosphere by passing statutes. Others clearly thought they could, and the bill passed the Georgia House 127 to 7 and went to the state Senate. The Senate did not reconvene to take up the matter until the next week, so that legislators who had not seen the objectionable performance <laughs> now had a chance to do so. In the end, the Georgia Senate seems to have focused on other bills, including ones that gave married women control of their own earnings and raised the age of consent to 14, and it did not take up the proposed legislation. The dance went on. The brouhaha over the streets of Cairo reveals the tension in late Victorian attitudes about sex. But it also points to the ways in which whites used sexuality to construct the other. A darker skin indicated a supercharged libido, one that had to be constrained on the part of men and could be easily exploited in women. To whites, dark-skinned women signaled sexual availability. Therefore, they ogled Chinese women appearing in court, Middle Eastern women performing on stage, and African-American women going about their ordinary business. The kind of overt sexuality that whites ascribed to people of color contrasted with the rigid moral code that Europeans believed ordered their own society. The failure of non-whites to develop such a code uh, that governs sexual relations and their apparent inability to abide by one white people introduced to them provided evidence for their inferiority. When whites attended the performance of the streets of Cairo, hired Chinese prostitutes, or forced themselves on African American women, they believed it represented a personal failing not the weakness of their moral code. This recognition confirmed what they believed to be their own culture's superiority. Nowhere, perhaps, were the implications of that conviction of superiority as clear as at the Dahomey village with its residents from what is today the People's Republic of Benin. The barely clad, dark-skinned women who huddled about an open fire in front of a grass hut stood in stark contrast to the throngs that strolled among the grand buildings celebrating the South's progress. Banners advertised its residents as cannibals. The women's section of the Atlanta Constitution described the African women as 
entirely like apes. One of the advertised features of the Dahomey village was the so-called Amazon warriors. Since the 17th century, the king of Dahomey had used women warriors, first as bodyguards and then as elite troops. And by the mid-19th century, they comprised a third of the Dahomey army. The scarified, red-marked faces and reportedly fierce temperaments of the Amazons attracted considerable attention at a number of late 19th century expositions. They seemed to be not only the opposite of white women, confined to the domestic sphere, but perversions of the divine order of the universe. Few visitors to the Dahomey village questioned the depiction of Africa and Africans because most people knew little about the continent except that Europeans were being civilized uh, by, or that Europeans were bringing civilized, uh, civilization to Africa by carving it up into colonial empires. Dahomey villages appeared at expositions because they served imperial goals. Europeans offered African civilizations that could lift them out of the savagery that villages depicted. At the Cotton States Exposition, however, the ideological value of the Dahomey village lay primarily in the contrast it provided to civilized African Americans. Whites believed that slavery had saved African Americans from the savagery of Africa, and the popularity of the Dahomey village, not only in Atlanta, but also in, at expositions in Chicago, San Francisco, and elsewhere throughout the country, represented a growing consensus among white Americans on race. The one challenge to this view at the Cotton States Exposition came from Henry M. Turner, a bishop in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. As Turner strolled down the midway one day, he heard the Barker urge villagers to see the wild cannibals from the west coast of Africa. Turner verbally accosted the man. Why do you white men pursue the Negro to Africa with your lying? The Barker questioned what the black man knew about subject. Turner, an advocate of African-American immigration to Africa, actually had lived in Africa, so he spoke with authority. There are not and never have been any cannibals on the west coast of Africa, he charged. You are simply repeating some of the lies told by white men who went to Africa and had to lie about the country to magnify their own efforts and pose as heroes of great courage and endurance. Turner was willing to grant that Africans might be heathens and uncivilized. Remember, he is, he is a Methodist bishop. But they also were, he said, more peaceable and gentle than many of you civilized and enlightened white men here in America. He concluded his tirade by reiterating, stop your lying about the Negro." Turner's anger stemmed not only from the lies, but from the use to which whites put the lies. The global oppression of people of color by whites laying claim to racial superiority provoked his response. Of all the foreigners at the fair, those who staffed the ethnographic villages were the least powerful. They left the sparsest record. Consequently, how residents of ethnographic villages viewed their role in the Cotton States Exposition is unknown, but there are hints. The Chinese women testified in court that they were participating of their own free will. They might have spoken under duress, but they also might have found working in a midway show preferable to the poverty of their homeland or the subservient position in which they would have occupied as wives in the households of their in-laws. The charade of their presence at the Cotton States Exposition was, of course, in defiance of the Chinese Exclusion Act and marked them as resistors to a racist policy. The bullfighters in the Mexican village seemed happy enough until organizers canceled the bullfight. Two days after their walkout, however, a small fire broke out at the entrance of the village. And just before the exposition closed, a second fire claimed one life and destroyed much of the village. 
Not only did the matadors go on strike, but they also perhaps resorted to arson, the crime of the powerless, to protest their treatment. The only act of resistance by the dancers at the streets of Cairo that we know about occurred when a Chinese man entered the theater and took a seat in the front row. Fatima, according to reports, suddenly stopped the dance and swooped down upon the Oriental like a whirlwind. Police had to break up the fight. The man had violated Fatima's own sense of racial propriety. And although he had paid his admission fee, she was determined not to dance for him. The Dahomeans in Atlanta demonstrated no such volatility. But in Chicago, the Dahomean women apparently chanted in their own language a refrain that translates as, if you will come to our country, we will take the pleasure of cutting your white throats. <laughs> when a white woman from Atlanta who visited the Chicago fair pointed at the facial scars and paint of a Dahomey woman, the Dahomean attacked her with an ax uh, which the Atlanta Belle fended off with her silk parasol until bystanders restrained the enraged woman. These accounts indicate that the Dahomeans were not happy being midway attractions. As an enterprise to globalize the South, the Cotton States Exposition met with little success, at least on a superficial level. Only five nations sent official exhibits, and even private commercial displays were spotty. Global education took place primarily on the midway, where stereotype and fabrication prevailed. Most visitors to the fair probably left with no more accurate information about the world than Samuel Hall had when he wrote Isaac Avery about opportunities for young men in South America. But the South, like the nation, was on the threshold of an overseas empire. Just two years after the exposition closed, the United States would go to war with Spain and end up with colonies in the Pacific and Caribbean. The Cotton States Exposition helped prepare Southerners for that development, not by providing a global education, but by encouraging white Southerners to apply their ideas about race to the rest of the world. The Cotton States Exposition took place as white supremacists consolidated and strengthened their hold on the region's economic and political life. As organizers looked to the future, they did not see international partnerships. Instead, they imagined a commercial empire rooted in their most cherished beliefs, the superiority of whites and the subordination of people of color. At the end of the century, the rest of the nation shared that vision. This legacy has been a hard one for Southerners and other Americans to renounce. And many people continue to harbor misgivings about trade policies, outsourcing of jobs, immigration, and other global issues. Atlanta and the South, however, have become major players on the world stage home to CNN and host to the Olympic Games in 1996, Atlanta boasts 18 sister cities and consuls from over 30 countries. In 2008, Georgia ranked 15th, and Texas, South Carolina, Kentucky, North Carolina, Tennessee, Louisiana, and Florida appeared in the top 20 states of the Kauffman Foundation's ranking by globalization indicators of foreign exports, and investment. The region may finally be realizing the global south that organizers of the Cotton States Exposition envisioned, but on very different terms than they ever could have imagined. Thank you. we have some house lights and I'll be happy to take questions if you have any. I, I think that, that, I certainly think that one of the things the Cotton States Exposition did was make Atlanta's reputation, at least for the, uh, for the next 10 years or so. Um, there is an event that follows in the next decade that 
uh, challenge that view, and that's the Atlanta race right of, of 2006, and I mean of uh, 1906. God, I gotta get in the right century. I am a historian after all. Um, and, and so I think that, I think that, that it did have that, that impact. It, it, it clearly established Atlanta as the capital of the New South. But I do think that it also fixed in people's minds a view of the world that was very uh, centered on the United States. It was very centered on the South. I think that while there were plenty of people like your, your grandfather for whom it opened new vistas, that there were limits to those vistas. He, after all, moved to Georgia. He didn't move to Mexico. Um, and, and so I think that, that it, it cuts really both ways. One of the things that it probably did was that it, it probably popularized interest in other countries. And I have not found, um, although I did look to um, see if there were subscription lists to the Smithsonian's um, Bureau of Ethnography reports because uh, the people subscribed to them and they got them sort of like National Geographic and, and you know looking at those subscription figures might give us an idea if they, if they spike after 1895 it, it may indicate something. On the other hand I should say that this is not the only World's Fair that's in the South. In, in the period I'm talking about. There was one in New Orleans in, in the 1880s. Uh, there was one in Charleston in 1901. There's one in Nashville, I think, in 97, 1897 or 8. There's one in Jamestown in 1907. Um, all of these have the, have the effect of, of increasing interest in the broader world. But it was kind of an imperial interest. It was the idea of, of you know, we're the center and, you know, all of these people are going to make our lives better. And, and there was very little in the way of making their lives better except all the great products we could sell them. And, and I think that is, is, is very much the, the tenor of the times. Uh, at this period. 